Hey, good morning and welcome to We're Burning Daylight. I'm Belinda Haddock. I'm one of the staff pastors at Hope Assembly of God Church in Lavernia, Texas. And if you've been following us, you know that we have been going through the book Live Dead Joy by Dick Brogdon, reading some of the daily scripture readings together here, as well as uh, the devotional that goes along with it. So I have my cup of coffee, so I'm ready to go. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to start in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, but I'm only going to read Solomon's prayer, okay? So we are starting basically at verse 16, into verse 16. It says, Now, Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, You shall never fail to have a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons are careful in all they do to walk before me according to my law, as you have done. And now, O Lord God of Israel, let your words that you promised your servant David come true. But will God really dwell on earth with men? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built? Yet, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. O oh Lord my God, hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night, this place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place of which you said you would put your, sorry, hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. When a man wrongs his neighbor and is required to take an oath and he comes and swears the oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, repaying the guilty by bringing down on his own head what he has done. Declare the innocent not guilty, and so establish his innocence. When your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back and confess your name, praying and making supplication before you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land you gave them and their fathers. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. When famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when enemies besiege them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or plea is made by any of your people Israel, each one aware of his afflictions and pains, and spreading out his hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and deal with each man according to all he has done, or all he does, since you know his heart, for you alone know the hearts of men, so that they will fear you and walk in your ways all the time they live in the land you gave your fathers. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks of you so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your own people Israel and may know that this house I have built bears your name. When your people go to war against their enemies, wherever you send them, and when they pray to you toward this city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to the enemy who takes them captive to a land far away or near, and if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive and repent and plead 
with you in the land of their captivity and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their captivity, where they were taken away and pray toward the land you gave their fathers, toward the city you have chosen and toward the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their pleas and uphold their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now, my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Now arise, O Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests, O Lord God, be clothed in salvation, with salvation. May your saints rejoice in your goodness. O Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. Remember the great love promised to David, your servant. And now we're going to go, we're going to skip the psalm today. I know, uh, but it's pretty short. You go read it. Uh, we're going to skip the psalm. We're going to go right into the gospel. So we're going to Mark and we're reading chapter 10. I'm going to start at verse 17. This is on the rich young ruler. Okay. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Wink, wink, because he's God. But anyway, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we've, we've left everything to follow you. I'll tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them, persecutions, thanks for that, Jesus, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And then finally, on our scripture reading, we go to Hebrews chapter 12. And you know from yesterday's reading that Pastor Bobby read through the faith chapter, the by faith, by faith, all of these people. And so it begins in verse one, chapter 12, therefore, so keeping that in mind, all of these by faith people, right? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such oppression from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you 
as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate tr children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Verse 11 is one of my favorites. And yes, I do apply it to, you know, my exercise, my crossfitting. Um, but obviously in this context, that's not, that's not what he's talking about. But I do feel that it, it's a powerful statement overall in our lives regarding discipline. And it says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. All right, well, let's take a look at our devotion reading today that goes along with what we just read. It's uh, called Despising Shame. And as a reminder, the reading for today in its entirety is Second Chronicles 4 through 6. Psalm 127, Mark 10, and Hebrews 12. Looking to Jesus helps us be ashamed of shame. When our eyes are fixed on ourselves, we notice our nakedness. We blush and construct awkward fig leaf clothing. When we are oblivious to ourselves, it is hard to be ashamed. Shame is directly connected to self-consciousness. We were designed to live God-conscious lives, for there is no shame in Him. It is not so much that God wants us to stop thinking highly or lowly of ourselves. He wants us to not think of ourselves at all, but to fix our eyes and attention on Him. A naked baby can saunter into a room shamelessly, for not only does the child not notice or know that she's naked, she also does not know that we know that she's naked. There's no shame for there is no self-consciousness. We despise shame by being radically God conscious. And it has a, um, a quote here from a hymn. And it says, since my eyes were fixed on Jesus, I've lost sight of all beside. So enchained my spirit's vision looking at the crucified. Eyes fixed on Jesus leads to shameless hearts. Jesus endured the cross, endured hostility from sinners, and even endured the chastening of God, all which brought intense shame for the joy set before him, for what he could see. And we reference back to Hebrews 12 on that. Yes, part of that joy was the redemption of humanity, but textually, Jesus' joy was connected to sitting down at the right hand of the Father. God is the joy of God. An eternal God was not incomplete before the creation and redemption of humanity. God delights in God and the joy set before Jesus that empowered him to endure horrific shame was the joy of union with the Father. If Jesus' antidote to shame was the delight of intimacy with the Father, then ours must be the same. Just because we despise shame does not mean we will escape shame. As we draw closer and closer to the return of Jesus, we will increasingly be the blight and bane of the world. We will face more shame, not less. It will become less and less respectable to be a devoted follower of Jesus. Unfortunately, I think we can say that even now, right? Our future guarantees more scorn, more abuse, more disdain, and more shame, not less. We despise shame, not by avoiding it, but by ignoring it as we fix our eyes on Jesus. Looking to Jesus clothes us, for when our eyes are fixed on him, he clothes us with his righteousness, and he covers 
all our shame. When we have sinned and shamed ourselves, our loved ones, when we have sinned and shamed ourselves and our loved ones, there is only one recourse. It is not to look at ourselves or to look, or, or those who look at us in our misery. It is to fix our eyes on Jesus, to walk toward him and let him cover us. Amen. Amen. Let me pray quickly with you. Lord, we thank you so much that you are our joy. We thank you so much, Lord, that you cover our shame. And God, let us fix our eyes on you. Let us worship you. Lord, as we're reminded by King Solomon, as he prayed in the temple, and he said, from heaven, hear, hear your people, forgive, hear your people and act. Lord, we ask that you do the same. As we fix our eyes on you and trust you, God, that you hear us, that you forgive us, that you set our path straight, that you direct us and that you lead us with your loving arm. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the author and perfecter of our faith and that you love us so dearly. God, help us to go be salt and light. And Lord, let us be covered in your presence in all that we say and do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.